Welcome to the panel on community trademark practice. It's rare that a lawyer lets her clients, not one, not two, but three people actually talk to other, in the presence of other lawyers. But, um, <laughs> well, I'm um, very excited for this panel, and uh, I have my very interesting clients, as you can see, and um, all three of them give me instructions and put me in the suit, so I'm the boring one, so I'll keep my talking to a minimum and let them talk, but I'll just set the tone for the panel a little. So your project has been released, has developed quite a reputation, and uh, it, has a, it has a lovely name with all sorts of puns in, built in there. And then it actually acquires either a secondary meaning or it is just anyway such a great different name that everybody would like you to have a trademark on it. You get a lawyer. You get it registered, and now you, poof, have a brand. And because there's so much quality as well as service inbuilt in it, then you start to begin to understand what trademarks is. Now, I think I'm going to sit. <laughs> That'll be just easier. Trademarks, um, the function of which is to inform the consumers about the source of goods and services with which the mark is associated. Like other forms of property rights can sometimes seem to run counter with the free and open source software world's ethos. They're often used by commercial parties as a tool for control, for quality, accountability, but mostly to stop everyone from doing anything with their products. Sometimes I like to give a talk which is like, hey, I'm not a Louis Vuitton bag, I'm a free and open source project. And, um, Earlier this year, I also read something like Trump for President LLC registered something called Trumpocrat, and, which is going to be used for colognes. And what's the captivating scent? It's the new fragrance for Trump voting Democrats. Sorry, I'm just Indian. We would like to make fun of things <laughs> when it's another country's politics. <clears throat> In the free and open source software world, where projects are committed to maintaining quality, but also freely encouraging copying, modifying, redistribution of copyrighted software, traditional trademark law also needs hacking. Instead of discouraging from anyone from using their mark, projects are interested in wider usage and dissemination of the software program that they have developed. But they do not wish to lose their rights either owing to abandonment, naked licensing, or genericide. Are there uniform principles that these projects follow? What happens when there are multiple projects under one umbrella, for example, the Apache Software Foundation? What are the inward-facing challenges, and what are the outward ones that need to be policed? I have the pleasure, as I said, of having a very distinguished panel again. They are special for many, many reasons, least of all for this amazing dressing. And um, uh, yeah, I, it's, yeah so it's, it's just rare that somebody really ups the fashion ante, and I'm very excited about that. So um, Th This was discussed quite a lot, actually. <laughs> They're all leaders of world-class free and open source software projects. Fortunately, all are our clients and what motivates us and uh, keeps giving me and paying me in fun. And all non-lawyers. And uh, to, we will all be exploring the dilemma that they face while they write their trademark policies, the steps they undertake to maintain the effectiveness of their brand without compromising on their underlying political pr principles. And hopefully the discussion will shine some light on the gray areas of trademark law for free software projects. We have Shane with us, and Shane serves as Vice President of Brand Management at the Apache Software Foundation, setting policy for trademarks and branding across all of 200 plus Apache projects, and has served as a five-time director. We also have Neil McGovern, is the current Debian project leader and an advocate for digital rights and free software.
then we have Nathan. And Nathan, since 2009, has acted as a project and product, uh, product manager and board member of XBMC Foundation, also known as Cody now. And uh, he's the president of the XBMC Foundation currently. It's the corporation behind the development of Cody Media Center. I'm sure many of you are already running it, or if not, should be running it. And so here we are to, I'm going to start and I'm going to let you talk about your organizations and your projects uh, for a little while before we jump on to questions and then let lead the conversation with questions acting as uh, guideposts. So please, Nathan. Okay, um, I'll, I'll start. And actually, I want to start by talking about how we're dressed. When we, when, when, when we, we started talking about doing this, this panel, we didn't know, well, I didn't know how we should handle it because we're not lawyers. And, and I think we're all part of the West Coast mentality. I don't know if any of us actually live on the West Coast. But we're all part of that mentality where you're supposed to dress as down as possible. And the person who looks the most like a homeless person is the winner. <laughs> um, and so I said, well, I'll just wear jeans. And we really, we really up the ante from my just wearing jeans. Anyway, um, so, so I'm Nate. Uh, I started with Cody uh, back when it was called XBMC. Um, and I started, my username for the project was Nate Thomas because way back then, this was way before I was even a member, it was, it was back when it was on the Xbox and it was quite frankly probably illegal a little bit. Um, and so everyone hid their name behind some, some random username that didn't make any sense. Um, and mine was Nate Thomas. Thomas has nothing to do with my actual name, so that's, I, thought it was, I thought it was a great cover. Um, <laughs> But then uh, a year or two later, we expanded out into computers and everything else on the planet. And um, that's kind of where we are now. We're a media center that works on everything, except for Roku's. <laughs> Wanted to do an intro. Yeah. So uh, I'm Shanker Crew. I've been involved at Apache since November of 99. Uh, I actually started my involvement at Apache when I was working at IBM on a day job where IBM donated some code to Apache, so I became a commander to Apache through that. When my day job turned directions, and I was no longer getting paid to write code here, I hung around in Apache because I thought it was fun. It was a lot of cool. So that involvement got me elected as a member back in 2002, and uh, got onto the board uh, several years back, and through that, essentially got myself appointed as VP of brand management because up until that point, we didn't have a consistent brand policy for the foundation. So the one important thing to realize about the Apache Software Foundation, we are a 501c3, we are truly a public charity. We give away software for the public good, and that is, that's what drives our decisions. Uh, the two important things are, all of our governance is by volunteers. We have no paid staff who make governance or policy decisions, decisions at either the foundation or at any of our projects. And the other one is, we have a foundation which in one way is a little bit like software in the public interest in that it provides the, the legal tie together of everything. But on the other hand, we have 200 different projects and initiatives at Apache, each of whom have their own entirely separate community and have their own direction. So there is no Apache strategy overall. Apache Hadoop has a strategy, and Apache CloudStack has a strategy, and Apache Lucene has a strategy. But the foundation doesn't tell projects where to go. We just help them to get there. So that's about the Apache. Sorry, sorry. Sure, so my name's Neil. Um, I've been involved with Debian since early 2000 or so and in, in various roles there. So affiliated with, I was on the board of Software in the Public Interest for uh, about six years or something and served as secretary of that organization. Um, involved with the Open Rights Group in the UK. As, as, as some as you can probably tell, I'm, I'm not actually American. Um, so so a, bit, a bit further east than over um, here. I thought that was a big here. accent. Um, and and so, so Debian's in an interesting position where we have over a thousand official developers and about four thousand or so maintainers, but about we worked out about ten or fifteen thousand people who contribute somehow to Debian, and Debian is entirely voluntary driven. So um, its ability to make central decisions about 
what is Debian or what Debian does is is kind of interesting. Uh, although I've been elected as the project leader, um, I've often described it as a simply a figurehead position. Um, although I'm technically lead the project, I can't actually tell anyone what to do because they're volunteers and they'll just say no and just carry on doing their own thing anyway. Um, herding cats has been used often, um, <laughs> but uh, that, that thing produces interesting effects when it comes to things like trademarks and what our policies should be in different areas. Um, we work all in the public and we try and formulate these policies in the public, but then that can be quite difficult when talking to a organization who wants to be open and honest with what their position is and that doesn't work too well when oh well let's just have this on this public mailing list which will be archived forever. Yeah so really um, briefly in informing our trademark policy Apache by default everything in Apache is done on a public mailing list with the exception of either legal issues because we can't uh, issues about people when we want to vote a new person in we, we hold that in private so if it fails then we don't embarrass them. But when I was forming the trademark policy, I I did not do it in public. I did it in private, um, partly because it's, it's messy dealing with legal details. And more to the point, uh, my background inside of Apache is not just the nine-member board, but members of Apache, i.e. shareholders of the corporation itself, all have essentially, or believe they have, a say in the running of the foundation as an organization. So my task was to get a thing done with 400 extremely talented, very high functioning, uh, very... Opinionated? Yes, that's the word, thank yeah. you. Uh, people all trying to do different things. And that was far, that was, you know, harder than I really wanted. So there's no way I was going to go for the public group. Although, we certainly try to do things in public. That's actually, that was a problem we had too. We, um, we had to go through a name change for various reasons. Um, and uh, when we did that, we had, to, we had to make a decision very early on whether we were going to be public about this name change from the beginning, and we decided to go private as well. We we were public to the extent, or we were private to the extent that every one of the members of the foundation, or the shareholders, whatever you want to call them, um, they they were in on it, and they had an ability to make part of the decision. But everyone outside of that community wasn't involved, and and the reason we went this way was because uh, it's a, it's a, as far as we can tell, trademarking is an incredibly incredibly um, cryptic. Yeah. Great process, um, and it takes forever. And and we didn't want the name we ultimately decided on to get leaked because we didn't know if someone was going to take it and start using it, which of course they did almost immediately the second we told everybody. Um, and so yeah, we went private too. This is amazing. This is a, I think this is amazing. That Just like clients that they've already decided what's going to be tagged before the lawyer can actually say anything, and I love it. What I wanted to ask was that companies and nonprofit foundations seek to accomplish different goals through the enforcement of trademarks and even use of trademarks. And I wanted to ask each of them who are successful FOSS projects that to tell us how have they structured their trademark policies? Why are they structured the way they are? And what are your motivations? You've heard some snippets already, and I hope we will hear more. And also from other people in the audience, there's B. Del Garvey, who's also from the president of the Software in Public Interest, which has other many projects, 38 at least for now, and every day increasing. And SPI owns their trademarks and helps them uh, in enforcement. So there will be more interesting conversations. So Neil, why don't you start? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so. The important thing I think Debian views is the is, is around the purpose of, of of trademarks. It's a something which must exist as a consumer protection device. It's not something that the Debian project wants to use um, to try and enforce its view of what Debian is or to extract value out of it. It's simply there to ensure that when people get something called Debian that they get this good experience and that they they trust that this software is what they expect to see. Um, so I mean, the aim of our trademark policy is really to encourage the widespread use and sort of adoption of these Debian trademarks. Um, 
and specifically not limit that um, in any way for anyone who wants to use that commercially as well. So rather than a, as I think you mentioned, the, the sort of handbag um, analogy, we want people to use the Debian trademarks. We want people to be able to use that and to extract value from that. And in doing so, that also ties Debian in with, with the success that they have. So people are able to see that, that the Debian mark works there. Um, additionally, we want to, on the other hand, present uh, misuse of, of trademarks, um, but only in a way that could confuse users or um, somehow have unintended consequences. So people think that whatever they're using is something that has come from the Debian project or something that um, isn't endorsed by us or, or goes against the fundamental social contract which we have with our users. Do you, do you have an example of that? Has, has that happened where, it's, where, where someone's actually used the Debian name in a way that's definitely not Debian? Yes. Um, Debian 1.0 was released by a, this was in 1990 mumble. Um, this is why Debian has never had a 1.0 release. Um, because we were preparing up to the stage of Debian 1.0 and a software vendor decided to grab the packages, roll a installer and then say, here, here's Debian 1.0 and um, it wasn't. So there has never been an official Debian 1.0. Um, so it can happen, but I often attribute a lot of these things to a misunderstanding or a, a, a requirement that, um, that that people have to try to try and do things and not through a deliberate malicious attempt. And, and that also goes to a lot of our, uh, my view on where our enforcement comes from as well. But I think we're going to talk about that later. So, so the, it's interesting because the way I worked with the Apache members to form the Apache Software Foundation's trademark policy, which covers all 200 of our projects. So this is things like Hadoop, as well as the web server, as well as Lucene and CloudStack and everything, is uh, that's not an easy thing to do for all the projects. And it doesn't, you know, it's not from the point of view of the projects. Really, the, our policy is from the point of view of the foundation. So the foundation itself doesn't actually produce the software our projects do. But the foundation shares a brand with all the projects, and that is by design. Every Apache project on their homepage should say Apache Hadoop. Now, there are a lot of people in the industry or in the trade press who say just Hadoop, you know, whatever, I'm not going to argue that much. But the project really is Apache Hadoop, which ties all the projects together in one brand. So the foundation is the owner of all Apache trademarks on behalf of our projects. So that's the, the background. So the, I was thinking of there's two reasons we have a trademark policy. And the first one is really because of all of you. Um, actually, I shouldn't point to everybody out there. I'll only point to the lawyers out there. Uh, really, the first reason we have a trademark policy is because we want, we need to be able to defend our own use of the brand. I really, I don't care about that. But if I don't have a policy, then some of these companies, especially smaller VC-funded companies who don't care about reputation, who just want to chase market share, they're going to co-opt our brand, take it over, and I need to be able to stop that. So I have to have a policy. At least that's what my lawyers tell me. So, But the real purpose from our point of view of having a trademark policy is giving our project communities credit. So just like Debian, from the Apache point of view, everybody who works on Apache software projects are volunteers from our point of view. Now, I think we're, we're, we're glossing over a little bit of the fact that of those thousands of people who contribute code to one of our projects, many of them actually are paid by some of your employers or at least the industry people here, right, to work on our projects, which we, I, I don't care why a person, why you or you are working on our project. At Apache, we assume you were an individual working for the betterment of that project. Now, you happen to use that software in your company, which is why you're doing it, but from my point of view. So I want to make sure that when our Apache brands are used by industry companies who want to profit off of our brand, quite frankly, that our community gets the credit they deserve, both because they deserve the credit as well as that way new users can find out, oh, there's an Apache version of this thing. Maybe new users will become new contributors. So fundamentally for Apache, defending our brands is enabling our ability to potentially find new contributors to our projects in the future. Um. Um, 
You know, our, our trademark, actually, first, I want to go back to your not having a 1.0. Weirdly enough, we never did either. This was before my time, but we went straight from XBMC Beta 6, I think, to XBMC 2.0. I don't know. There was no reason. Nobody packaged it for us. It was just like, yeah, we're good enough for a 2.0 at this point. <laughs> um, but uh, in terms of why we went with a trademark, I think it, it, it fits more with Neil, I think, in that... The, the goal that we have with this trademark is entirely to inform users uh, what is a, basically we consider a quality product and what isn't. Um, and one of the big drivers, uh, there were two, I'm not going to go into the other one, but one of the big drivers behind getting the trademark that we got was um, way back in 2013 or something like that, uh, some organization came out with, I forget what they called it, it was like, XBMC for Android or something, like the, the, re, the best version of XBMC for Android or something like that. And what they did was they took our code, completely removed the, the video player that we had in it, um, and, and then forced you on Android to install a second video player um, that could play more things than we could at the time. Um, and and it, it, it worked very poorly. Um, and it, it, it ended up costing people money sometimes, and it was a real, it was a, it was just the, not great. It was not a great, it was not a great situation. And, and that was really one of the, the major drivers for us. We said, we can't, you, we can't have people calling something our name when it obviously isn't us. Um, and, and so we, we started down the path of getting a trademark and going with a new name because trademarking Xbox Media Center doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and and that's sort of the, the, the route we went down. These days, strangely enough, that same desire to inform users remains, but it's based on a completely different thing these days. Uh, Cody has what's called add-ons, which are basically the same thing as applications for Android or whatever. Um, the idea is that you can install something else into Kodi and it'll increase the usability. Like you can install the YouTube app and then you'll be able to watch YouTube in Kodi. Um, and for the longest time, basically from the moment that we started this trademark route, people have been creating new and more exciting ways to turn Kodi into the next, uh, oh shoot, what's the name of that, that, that music next downloader? Media Center. Just uh, Napster. They, they've come up with <laughs> new and amazing ways to turn Cody into the next Napster, which we never wanted. We want Cody to be a video player that you can then do things with. We don't want Cody to be the the thing that that acquires content. It's just not it's not its job. That's other other op, uh, operations jobs. Um, and so and so, at least at this point now, the major purpose of our brand is to is to inform people that we are this application, we're not this application. And one, so that's interesting, one, one reason I think is Apache tends to have a lot of server-side technical tools, so we don't have many end-user applications, except of course Apache OpenOffice, which is the most widely downloaded free software office suite. But one thing we haven't talked about is how our policies actually work. We'll talk about that more, but one of the ways that we wrote our policy at Apache is much like you have your applications for Kodi. Um, I wrote the policies to minimize the number of interactions that third parties would have with us to ask for permissions to do things. Because we, as a volunteer organization, it's expensive for us to have to go answer questions, especially when questions come from some lawyer or some VP of marketing, and they go to this private list of a bunch of geeks who just write the code. So they are not the people who the, the other person is expecting to have an answer from. So it's expensive for us to, to answer those questions. So one of the things that we have in our policy is you may use an Apache project brand within your software product brand without permission as long as you do it in exactly this format. So you can have your Yoyo Dyn accelerator for Apache Cloud Stack. And you can use that as your project name for a software product. Uh, because it shows a clear difference between your Yoyo Dyn Accelerator and our Apache CloudStack brand. It's powered by, or a plug-in for, whatever. There, there are obvious, you know, tactical connections that are made. But I don't want people to have to ask me for that, because I don't have the time, it, just me, and our projects don't have the expertise to say yes or no. 
So as long as you do it exactly that format, please feel free. Go ahead. Yeah, that's exactly how ours is. Yes. Powered by. That being said, you may not, under any circumstances, use Apache Hadoop as your software product name in any other form. And we will not grant exceptions to that. So it's, uh, you know, th there are a few things in our policy that, yes, you can just do this as long as you comply and, and you say, yes, it's our mark and you attribute us. But otherwise, we basically say, no, you can't do these things. All three projects have very exhaustive um, trademark policies. Please visit their websites to study them. Apache Software Foundation even explains basic concepts of trademark <laughs> law in their I, policy. I might, did not write that policy. <laughs> and, uh, it's under the Apache license. So. But they're all very clear about what you can do, what you cannot do, and if, what you are, how, if you decide to use the mark, what are the ways you do it. It's not lazy lawyering, it's just balancing it out, I believe, uh, that we want people to use it, but we want them to use it right. And also this consumer protection thing, you get what you see, it's not something else. So um, we talked about this, um, about that, uh, Shane, you touched upon it about that most FOSS projects neither have the resources nor the interest in expending their energies in trademark enforcement activities. People would much rather spend their time in making great software so that all of us can use it and maybe not sending me too much work. I'm happy to take it, but still. Um, they, are also, they are trying to each time balance it out that more people should be able to use it, but we don't have the time. And if somebody is not doing what we want, we cannot just keep sending them cease and desist letters. So, and also there is another thing that you don't want to lose your rights just because of abandonment or naked licensing. So how do you balance these conflicting interests? Uh, not easily. Yeah. It's terrible. It's, it, it, it's the hardest thing I think any of us probably do because I, I don't know about you guys, but in, in our world, I mean, there's a new person misusing the trademark every single day. It's completely, it's, it's every day. Um, and to some extent, we've tried. We, we've kind of put. To, we've, with your help, we put together a form letter, and and we, you know, we we have kind of a mass mailing list, basically, where we email people and say, please stop, or we try to find the source and say, please stop, uh, which has varying levels of success. But it's difficult, man. It's really hard. Yeah, I think interestingly, it, the abandonment um, issues are rather frustrating, because if they didn't exist, then our lives would be a lot easier, because we wouldn't have to necessarily enforce them, except where we absolutely wanted to. Um, so, for example, there is a organization that was using the Debian mark to promote their product or service, and it had the Debian logo, and it just said Debian, and then, let, let's call it Debian laptops. It's not, but um, I don't, don't necessarily want to embarrass the actual organization while discussions are ongoing. Um, but they say they were um, distributing laptops with Debian installed, and it just looked exactly like the Debian project is. Now, the traditional way of dealing with that is you send them a cease and desist. They do it or they don't do it, and then they get annoyed and they go away or they change their business model or whatever. But these are people who believe that Debian is good enough to put on laptops and are fans of the Debian project and want to do things. So how can we encourage people who want to use Debian, who want to promote Debian, and want to use that to, um, to, to further Debian project without sort of basically slapping them with lawsuits or cease and desist or lawyers' letters and encouraging people to come up with that? And, and that's a key thing as part of what we try and do with enforcing our trademark policy. So this we've, we've kind of quickly gone into the uh, naked licensing and abandonment, and I was going to say, uh, the ASF does not license our brands or software products. You can use the Powered By format, but that makes it clear that, you know, there's a clear technical relationship, and your brand is what you're really selling. So I don't really care if your quality sucks, because it's separated from Apache's. Um, I hadn't thought of abandon abandonment that way. The Since the foundation owns Mark on behalf of our projects, we ensure that our project source code um, will be available in perpetuity, or at least as long as we're around, which we hope is, you know, decades. Um, so that's there. In terms of actually going out and doing enforcement, which we're kind of talking about now, uh, it's just like 
somebody was talking about earlier, do it in private. Always contact people in private. Always politely but firmly. Um, always use specific examples. That's really, really hard both for our communities to come up with an example and for us to explain to somebody, especially somebody who's doing a marketing campaign around software, where, yes, their website uses the Powered by Format properly, but their marketing materials they hand out at a conference does not. Or their email blast that they send out to, you know, thousands of technical people, some of whom are us, um, isn't using it correctly. So we need to say, hey, in this email you didn't do it right. That's hard, really hard for us to um, get around to doing. But again, do it privately um, using titles. So I don't know if, if you guys, have, well, we're, we're all titled, but in the open source, you know, when we're working on the code, it doesn't matter what you're dressed like or whether or not you have a title or whether you're a contributor or a committer or whatever. We're all just kind of one vote. So it's really hard on my side. Apache communities ex ex explicitly are flat. So when you join an Apache project, everybody in the project essentially gets one vote or one ability to sway where the project will go. So that, on the technical side, works fine because the technical questions, you know, the compiler will give you the right answer eventually. You may swear and curse, but eventually the compiler will, either, will, will compile or it won't. Uh, and of course, trademark, somebody says, oh my god, they did that. And I'm like, is that okay? And I'm like, well, it depends. Well, that's not an easy answer. Um, uh, well, I have a whole presentation. I have a whole presentation that, that talks about exactly this this list. Uh, being specific, uh, assuming ignorance rather than malice. So absolutely, and especially because we're all nonprofits. So there's, you know, we absolutely could not send C C and D letters. I ignorance is guaranteed. Yes. I, I, almost every C and D letter that gets a reply is really. I didn't know that that was a problem. So that that's an interesting perspective. So we have 150 say active projects that major corporations are using that you know. All the industry leaders earlier are using at least 50 of in their major products. We've probably sent five or six C and Ds over Apache's entire history, but we address things privately. And the other one is, uh, I don't worry about the big companies because eventually I will find the right person at the big company who is either a lawyer or a VP of marketing who gets it, and they will say, "Oh, Apache's a serious player." Yeah, it really is their trademark. We'll fix it. It's the small companies, it's the VC funded companies who care about market share overall that I worry about because they're not going to care. And I don't want to have to send the C and D letter. So I guess the I'll just do one really, really brief one of the the going through the enforcement process. Uh, we will almost never call you, machine. Not that I don't want to call you. Um, we will almost never call over an enforcement action because our first thing will be contacting them privately. Then we will be having me send them an email with my title. I can have the president of the ASF or a board member send, the t send a mail to the CEO of the company, right? Eventually that should work. If that doesn't work, we are happy to use publicity and ostracization, i.e. not allowing that company's employees to participate in our projects. So I think, I don't know if that would work for you guys, but for Debian or an Apache, if, imagine if your company couldn't participate in Apache projects directly. That would be a strong one. Once, once the right person in engineering realized that, they would say, no, no, we'll fix it. Don't worry. Um, so we, we would seek to never actually get past that. We, we might send a and d letter just to that, but past that I, I would never, ever want to go. Um, one of the things which um, we do is help make the process more automated. Our resources are limited, and we do want to give the best possible legal advice. So we help them write these initial communication letters before it ever gets to the CND. Um, I will say that it's not that it's never. It's quite, sometimes you really have to clean up a lot of it. And there are domain name problems. There are also people selling t-shirts or caps or other commercial stuff without ever donating back to the project. And the project, uh, everyone thinks that's what they're doing and contributing. We've had similar issues, but we help them, um, at least the clients, to have some automated process so that uh, it's easy. But I'd let both of you talk about it. Yeah. Uh, the automated process? Or the traps you have, the issues you face, the hurdles, and what are the problems you think they are, and um, how do you approach them? Okay. Um, well, one of the things we tried to do sort of early on 
Um, there was another organization. This was the same organization that had originally did the XBMC for Android thing, where once we once they they started looking at all of the websites that we'd we'd registered when we announced our name, they said maybe they don't want us to use their name, <laughs> and we we said yeah that's that's a good guess. Um, and, and so we worked with them for a little while, and, and and they actually it was it was a nice process for a while because they created this alternative version of Cody that they called I forget what they called it is an alternative version of Cody that was just as horrible as you can imagine in the worst ways, and we were fine with that because it didn't have our name, it didn't use our logo, um, they complied with the GPL, we were great. Um, <laughs> And then, and this this happened maybe six months ago. Or, uh, they sent we we had released Cody fifteen point zero or whatever, um, and they sent out a mass email to everyone on their mailing list, which includes some of our developers, which said something along the lines of, "Hooray, Cody fifteen point zero is out. We're so excited about it. Here's a donation link to their website," <laughs> and we. Uh, th it, that's that's the kind of thing we deal with a lot, where they were convinced that what they had done was not wrong, and we were convinced that what they had done was the most ridiculously terrible thing imaginable, um, and and so so there was a very long back and forth after this, where where I think we kind of came to the point where I don't know. The reason this is such a big deal is because this is the organization that pushes a lot of that other stuff. And so as long as we can have a communication with them, we can make things work. You know, we can we can get our name away from their name. Um, and, and so we, we keep trying to have this communication with them. And, and as long as that communication happens, then it kind of spreads out from there. Once Once they know it's a problem and they switch things around, then... It, it kind of cascades, and everyone everyone that uses what they make kind of does the same thing. Um, so just firstly on t-shirts, um, interestingly, um, Debian itself doesn't make t-shirts. Everyone else does, and we don't particularly care. Um, interestingly, this, this logo here is one of the logos that Debian has. It's the red swirl with slightly frayed edges and things. Debian has another logo. The official use logo, which is the official Debian trademarked one, no one else is allowed to use, and nobody knows what it is. Everyone, everyone just uses the open use one. It's on T-shirts everywhere. No one uses the open, the official use one, and I think we probably just ditched it. Well, oh no, I did trademark infringement on our own logo once by just taking it and like modifying it or something for a different conference. For well, for Debian conference, which wasn't part of Debian at the time. But that's the only time that it's actually ever been used. So by locking up and restricting the use of these things, you can produce huge problems, which is why I'm quite keen on making sure that the Debian brand is able to be used quite a lot. Um, possibly interesting from the other side is when Debian itself has been trying to negotiate an incoming trademark agreement. Um, so we... Debian takes lots of software from uh, various places, we rebuild it, we apply security updates, uh, etc. There was a issue in 2008, 2007 I think, with uh, Mozilla and Firefox. Up until that point, um, Debian had an agreement with the Mozilla Foundation that we could use the Firefox brand and we were able to use their trademark to describe what we were distributing. Um, Debian is made of entirely free software um, and is sort of fairly famous as sticklers for that. Um, I'm sure John will... Uh, we, we have some disagreements that we think some things are free, some things aren't free, but, but in some cases we're more strict than, than the Free Software Foundation is and, and in other cases they're, they're more strict, but, but we've been doing that for a long time. And the issue for us was that the logo, the little Firefox around the globe thing, was not free. No one could modify it. So we came up with an alternative implementation. We said that, and we said, can we use this? And uh, Mozilla said, no. So we've had to rebrand Firefox as Ice Weasel, 
Um, it's essentially the same, just with a different name. But the ability to it, it is the, the problem with trademarks um, that that we're finding is that when something is ninety nine point nine percent the same and you're getting exactly the same experience, then how do you allow other people to use your mark? And even though there are some technical di differences or very slight differences that 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 produce problems there, and where that balance lies between being able to promote the use of, of, of your brand, but then where it diverges enough is, is always a judgment call, and that's quite hard to codify, and that's something we're, we're certainly struggling with. And it's, it's not, especially with system software, it's not easy to, to decide that. Um, I'll spare you stories of the 150 project issues that I've faced. Um, one thing is Apache produces software. We produce software products, typically software source code, actually. Uh, so our policy is very strict about software products and pre fairly lax about other products. Uh, so Apache's never going to provide services. We're never going to host people's Lucene search engines. We're, we're never going to get our act together to actually print t-shirts except for our own conference. So I'm actually in the process of working with a high quality t-shirt vendor to have a generic license agreement for any Apache project brand and they'll give back a certain percentage of profits. And you know, they had far more restrictions in the license than I did, but I'm like, hey, great, okay. Um, so it's it's focusing on what is important to our organization. We want to give away software. We want people to know that that software came from Apache. So maybe they'll come to us and give us more fixes. But thinking back to the panelists earlier, the biggest issue I have is not education of companies, which you have. Um, I think partly because you're more of a consumer product, and I'm representing mostly business and technical bits that go in servers, is education of the development communities. So my problem is I have 5,000 committers and who knows how many other contributors to Apache projects. I can't scale. I mean, we realized that a while ago. We want our projects to go do the basic policing up to the point where they you know, get no response and need somebody with a title. We want them to do it. And that's extremely difficult when it's a bunch of technical people from different companies you know, who may work on this in volunteer time, may work on it because of their employer during the week, whatever, um, who don't understand trademarks. So they think, I, I say, you know, trademark law is not a compiler. You can't just say, oh, this is wrong, that's right. It depends. That's hard. So first I have to get them to care about it because they're interested in the latest JSON library or, or getting, you know, doing more stuff. Once they care about it, I have to get them to understand it's not going to be easy to, to know which uses you have to address and which ones you don't. Especially because they say, well, yeah, that guy said, you know, that this thing was way better than Debian and Debian was total crap. I'm like, so? And they're like, yeah, but they're using Debian's name in vain. I'm like, that's nominative use, okay? Good. So there's nothing to complain about. You might not like it, but it has nothing to do with trademarks. And that alone takes a huge amount of effort because I have to stop my community members from go sending this flame mail to some organization yeah. over something that's not an issue. Yeah. Um, so it's for me, it's the education and figuring out how to get uh, all of our committers. The other one is, you know, our committers can send these letters or or if, so, if one of you asks, you know, can I have permission to do something different, our committer will go answer because that's what you do in an open source project. You answer questions. That doesn't work when it's your counsel asking the question. They expect something who, somebody who could sign a document. And our committers cannot sign documents. The three of us can. A few other people in our organizations can. I, I would think you could. Uh, no, no, I can't. No? Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> some of us can. I, I, I tell B oh, there, he can. Can. Yeah, please yeah, sign okay. things for me. And he goes and signs them. It's fine. So um, it, that's another whole aspect where there's a different, different style expectation of communication in terms of branding and trade, whether it's your lawyer legal team or your marketing team. Your marketing team expects an answer back within two days. And like, hey, we're all volunteers. I, I have a two week deadline, okay? So it's, it's for me figuring out how to get our communities at least a little bit self-sufficient. And it's not just the automated part, that can help, but it's also the enough knowledge to be effective at doing this. Um, no, I'd let you uh, speak, but then I would, because we're uh, already over time, oh. so I just wanted audience to at least have a chance to ask a question or two, but sure. please make your point and then we'll turn over the question. Okay, this is just a quick follow-up to educating users. The, the ice weasel thing was actually a major inspiration for us. When we, when we, when we put together our trademark policy, we, 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 we made this big exception and said, please use our code just don't use our name. 
uh, if you want to change it that much. Um, and and now we we spend a lot of time now having to educate users, saying yes. They're not using our name. That's great. We're very happy about that. Please stop yelling at them. <laughs> Do we have questions? Yeah, I don't understand what a non. I don't understand what a non-free trademark is. I thought all trademarks were restrictive. So could you describe what that issue was with Mozilla? Why the trademark was not free, and what a free trademark is, and how it differs from so, Mozilla's so this, plan. This was a. Um, a link between the the copyright that they hold on um, on their various different components of, of the foundation and and their trademark, and and these came into conflict. So Debian only distributes free software um, with a capital F. So things that you're allowed to modify, you can use for any field of endeavour. Um, it passes a number of tests to make sure, for example, that you're able to pass it on to. You're allowed to modify the entire thing and pass it on to others. Um, as part of that, unfortunately, that the, the license that they had on their logo, so the copyright license they had on their logo of Firefox, was restricted so you couldn't modify it. So if I wanted to, e even with a name change. Um, so we had to remove that and essentially change the name. Um, So it's so it's it's a it's a it's a position that the Debian project takes that everything, including all the graphics, everything that's um, distributed within the Debian project, must be modifiable. And this came into conflict with the trademark policy of Firefox because obviously, if they didn't want us to do anything with the logo or make any changes and still be able to use that. Yeah. So this this brings up a a uh, common problem in the non-lawyer circles and a common joke among the lawyer circles. Trademarks are not copyright. Copyright is not trademarks. So um, there's a really good point I had here, and I just lost it. Um, so it, one thing that I think is interesting in this is a lot of people from the, the non-lawyer side, a lot of people see this open source software. They say they, they get that it's free. They get that GPL, you have to kind of give stuff back. They assume that that license applies to everything you get with the software, including the logos, including the trademarks. I thought it was free. Yes. So, but now the lawyers understand that you, you have a copyright license to take the stuff of the code and run it and give it away, whatever, or sell it. And that, you know, trademarks and the brand are something completely different. You wouldn't even think of those. So one thing I find interesting is the Apache license includes a section, section six in the Apache license, explicitly excludes trademark and any brand rights from the license. So it's interesting that other, many of the other open source licenses don't mention that. Now, to a lawyer, that's implicit because it's a copyright license. It never says trademark. But to a non-lawyer, people assume it means everything. And that's another issue that, you know, perhaps some lawyers could help fix. We'll just take one more question and then wind up, but please feel free to talk. And, uh, but don't talk without my presence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're going to follow us around, right? <laughs> Um, so your your comment about copyright versus trademark might have a good segue to my question. I am a lawyer. I totally get everything you've said up there about trademarks. I have a kind of twist on it. So we can require copyright notices in a in a GPL license. We can't require a trademark notice, and we I, we have an open source platform. We'd like it to sit when people use it to say powered by ours is open edX. We'd like people to say that. We don't really want to require them. We're not like jerks, but I think we think that a lot of people would like to do that, but they don't really they don't really know that we want them to do that. We do have a tra um, trademark policy, and if you went and you clicked enough through the place to get there, you would see that we want you to do that. But anyway, I don't know if anybody has addressed that, but for us, we're small. We, we would feel like we would appreciate it, I guess. Yeah, I, we, we have the powered by format, which is in our trademark policy, and you don't need permission. And we also have a line of logos, that essentially are the Apache product logos, in a, in a black band that says powered by Apache. So it's sort of a, a house logo. And we will allow you to use that logo uh, for free on your things, on your software products. Right? So we, we address that. In terms of publicizing that, that's a hard problem for a nonprofit. That's that's interesting. Something we we don't really have. We have 
uh, and I would very much like to have um, something around powered by or or, 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 or something Intel similar. inside. Yeah, Registered. Debian inside, etc. Um, the and it's kind of, it's kind of interesting that there's a a number of large organisations. I won't mention their name in case it's. Um, yeah, well, they are here, but uh, that's why I won't mention their name. But um, who want to use the Debian mark. They're producing essentially a version of Debian. It has some minor changes. It has a slightly newer kernel, a couple of other patches. But they want to use Debian because it essentially is Debian. But it doesn't meet the strict definition of the project has created it. It uses the Debian installer. So a But, but for anyone who installs it and actually logs onto it and uses it, they'll just go, well, it's Debian, isn't it? Um, the... And, and so a middle way of trying to find out that. So at the moment we have the Debian trademark and we have a Debian derived distribution, which is a normative factual statement. Um, so isn't get covered. You don't need permission because you're just saying a fact. But something in between where we could say like Debian from Foo Vendor or something like that, or, or Debian produced by or someone with like magic extensions or something. That, so that's a really good and it's kind of like the Intel inside, but you need to be very specific. But I think one wrap-up point is yeah. the no one wrap-up point. My mic is to on. Do is to is, shut up their clients, so that's is, why the most senior person does it. No, and I've, I've had to spill cold water in people's laps. That's okay. An important difference way. here: lunch will occur now. Oh, thanks. But Bye. but one one important thing is you talk with your other for-profit clients. Their motivation is profit. Our motivation is different. And understanding that lunch is now. <laughs> understanding We're still that is important. One forty. Thanks so much. Sorry about that. Thank you very much, and just another round of applause for our panelists. And lunch is here. <laughs>